very special guest of these. Sometimes he's referred to as Wise Beard Man, as he's been so affectionately dubbed from the internet activist group Anonymous. And but but those of us who, who know him for his videos and his video channel and all of his activist work on his own website, ZenuTV.com, it is Mark Bunker. Mark just told me this is his tenth year protest in the Church of Scientology, and he has many, many, many stories to tell. We won't ask him to tell all of them today because, quite obviously, that would take forever. But if you go to his site, which again is xenutv.com, you can check out all the various videos he's done with ex scientologists old guard critics, and just about anything and everything that relates to exposing the church Scientology. So before, without further ado, here is Mark Bunker. Thank you, Don. Well, you're welcome. Why don't you tell us a little bit about what the process has been, um, what brought you to start exposing the Church of Scientology, protesting against, against them, and what you've learned over the last 10 years about that whole process? Well, um, it happened that I moved into a home in the Hollywood Hills back in 98. And the woman who lived in that home before me was a Scientologist. And she apparently didn't give them a forwarding address because I kept getting the, uh, the uh, celebrity magazine and all these other periodicals that Scientology would put out. And I'd, I'd be leafing through them, reading an ad for an e-meter going, what the hell are you talking about? Because they have their own language. And I, I thought it was interesting, and I'd seen some reports on 60 Minutes back in the 80s. Uh, um, that, uh, so I knew it was created by a science fiction writer, that uh, they had done some nasty things to people who were critics of the church. But back in the 80s, when you'd see a report like that, you turn off the TV and that would be it. Now, in the late 90s, when I found out again about Scientology, there was the internet. So I could do a search and start to find out information about them. And it was fascinating. Uh, I just started looking deeper and deeper into it. And what I found out was just so astonishing. I mean, the, the fact that they, um, uh, the top leaders of Scientology were arrested for Operation Snow White. Hubbard's wife and all these other top officials went to jail for breaking into the IRS and bugging officers and stealing documents. It's just fascinating that this could happen in America. And the church goes on. Mind-boggling. And, um, and the fact that uh, there was such a thing as, you know, the RPF, the Rehabilitation Project Force, where if you upset the Scientology leadership, they could essentially put you into a labor camp. And, you know, you're eating rice and beans and working hard labor until you get back in the good graces of management. And the more I, I looked into it, the more fascinated I was. And it just so happened that... There, uh, the, uh, there was an, uh, a place I was living at just prior to that in Glendale, California. And there was a man in my neighborhood whose home was raided. I didn't know it when the raid happened, but when I started looking into Scientology, I found out about Dennis Ehrlich, who lived only maybe six or eight blocks away from where I lived. Raided by the church. Raided by Scientology, yeah. Uh, he was uh, one of the people involved in um, the FactNet uh, situation back in the okay. 90s, where FactNet was sued for distributing OT3 and all the upper level materials. And they raided Arnie Lerma's house and did the same thing, and Bob Penny, both with FactNet, and Dennis Ehrlich. All of them, you know, posting on all religion Scientology, talking about these super secret scriptures. Uh, Priscilla Coates also lived in Glendale at the time, and she used to be in charge of the Cult Awareness Network uh, before Scientology took it over. Right. Which is obscene in itself. That's for those disturbing. Folks, yeah, for folks who weren't familiar, the Cult Awareness Network was the place for parents to go uh, if they needed uh, answers about you know, their children being lured into this group. And Scientology sued them into oblivion and bought the uh, the name and the phone list, and, and they now run the Cult Awareness Network. So now when troubled parents call for help, they get a Scientologist answering the phone, saying, oh no, Scientology's wonderful, let's send you some brochures about that. Mm -hmm. Very scary Very how they operate. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I met Priscilla Coates, and she said, you want to meet Dennis Eric? And I went, yeah. So, and Priscilla was holding, um, 
meetings, I think it was every Sunday at her house with former cult members, not just in Scientology, but other cults as well, and they all had to get together and talk. So she invited me over to that, and I met Dennis, and, and, uh, and I, I got the videotape of the raid of his home where the sheriff escorted Scientology's attorneys through uh, Dennis's home and seized his computer and all of his files, and, and I put that on the web. And uh, Priscilla had a bunch of TV shows from around the world, and I put those on the web too. Uh, I started I started working anonymously against Scientology in '98. Okay, so that's when your work began. You'd been researching right. up to that point, but you began publicly. Right. I started after. Um, CBS did a 60 minute piece on the Cult Awareness Network. I watched this thing on a, a I think it was a December in 98, and, and I thought, well, you know, there's probably people who haven't seen this report who would like to see it, and some people overseas who wouldn't have a chance to see it. And I had the video capturing equipment and editing equipment, which was very rare at that time. Right. There was very little video on the web. And I thought, well, I'm not an eloquent writer. There are other people like Andreas Helder Lund who has Zidu.net. There are other people who can write wonderful things about this. Maybe video is one way that I could help out. And I love video. I love video and audio and, and being able to see and hear people uh, tell their stories. I mean, that, that, that has much more impact than just reading their stories. Yeah. So I contacted some critics uh, in Europe and said, would you like to have a video file put on your website? Because I didn't have a site at that time. And they said, absolutely. So I took that uh, can piece and converted it and sent it to them. And that was the start of my capturing every Scientology broadcast that I possibly could, audio and video. Uh, a few months later, I, uh, I contacted Bob Minton. Bob and Stacy had just signed on to the uh, board of uh, FactNet. FactNet was being sued again over the, uh, this uh, nonsense with copyright violations. And they still exist, right? FactNet. Yeah, FactNet, FactNet survives uh, largely because Bob and Stacy came in and, and, and helped broker a deal. They sat down with Scientology directly with Mike Rinder and uh, Marty Rathbun and Ava Paquette and you know, their whole legal team. And they hashed out uh, a settlement agreement where it didn't cost FactNet any money. But they just had to sign an agreement saying they wouldn't distribute their copyright of material again. And if they did, they'd be fined a million dollars. Well, FactNet has, hasn't done that since. But there's no need for them to do it because it's out there. It's everywhere. Well, it's everywhere. So um, the information is loose. FactNet survives. And they announced that they were, you know, now on the board of directors of FactNet, and I emailed them and said, if there's anything I can do video-wise, let me know. And almost instantly, I got a phone call from them. And I talked to them about the possibility of doing a uh, Showa project. <coughs> Spielberg had uh, teamed up with um, Yelly Wiesel. I forget how to pronounce his name. The, the, the fellow behind the, the Holocaust Museum in LA. You know, the, yes. one of the most important people <laughs> in that field. And I, I'm not exactly sure how to pronounce his name right now. Uh, but anyway, I, uh, they had come up with a project where they were going to sit down with a, a, a camera and interview every Holocaust survivor that they possibly could and just get their stories on tape and on record for future generations. And I suggested, well, we should do something like that about Scientology. Let's talk to former members, get their stories down, and they thought it was a great idea. It's a brilliant idea. They invited me out to uh, a conference, a cult conference that was happening in Stanford, Connecticut, and flew me out there. That was the first time that I met them, and Bob put a, a small camera in my hand and, and uh, allowed me to run around and videotape everything behind the scenes, which was pretty remarkable because sure. they didn't know me. And, right. you know, Scientology is great at sending out spies. Yeah, we just discovered that here earlier with a private investigator. Right. So I could, I could easily have been somebody who, sure. who just wanted to get inside, and, and, and here I was getting videotape of their most personal private moments and seeing everybody who was involved with the, the group and everything. Um, but it was a lot of fun. And at the end of the, the, the uh, conference, um, Bob supplied me with uh, a camera and some editing equipment, uh, and we, we got started. 